Welcome to Artflex. This is Muti Olawi, your regular anchor of this uh, wonderful show. Um, today, we're going to be discussing about um, something very, very important. We have tried to switch from the entire demography to the demography within human uh, beings, particularly the literary-minded gurus in Africa. So, um, when we get to the other side of the studio, you will understand what I'm talking about. See me there. Welcome once again to Artflix, the show where we deeply go into the world within the world. Last time we discussed about the world within the world of Ngugu Wationgo, the man of literature as far as Kenya is concerned, or even when we talk about East Africa. When you talk about Africa even generally, you cannot eliminate Ngugu Wationgo. Anyway, today we are not going to go into that. Uh, you have already enjoyed the content of uh, the exploration made about the world of Ngugu Wationgo. But this time around, we are back at home. We are going to deeply discuss about someone that is known to the Somali community. You cannot say you are into uh, the literary work of uh, the Somalis and you fail to pass through this writer. And who is this person? By the time I introduce our, audience, our guest today, you get to understand who we are going to be talking about. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Uh, today, we, I want us to just uh, uh, tell us what you want to talk about. Uh, what, who is this person in Somali that you are trying to talk about today? All right. Uh, today, we'll be zeroing in on uh, a Somali British born right, uh, writer uh, by the name Nadifa Mohammed. Nadifa Mohammed. Yes. So, are we going to be exploring the entire world of Nadifa, or we will narrow it down to one no, aspect of? We are narrowing it down to one work. aspect. We are looking at uh, precisely the Orchard of Lost Souls. Okay. That is uh, a novel she wrote. Of the Orchard uh, of uh, Lost, Lost Souls. Souls. Yeah, oh. she has two novels: The Mamba Boy and The Orchard of Lost Souls. Okay. So today we are considering the Orchard of Lost Souls. All right. Before we go into the work of Nadifa, could you please uh, tell us? Um, um, about the background of this uh, writer. All right. Uh, she was born in 1981, mm -hmm. and uh, she grew up in Agesa. She was about eight years or seven years before she left. She left the country with her parent. Her father was a sailor, mm -hmm. and uh, she traveled outside the country which was to UK to the UK with her parents. Mm -hmm. When her parents was when they were about to come back mm -hmm. to the country. That was uh, at the time. That was the time where the civil war erupted. So they decided to stay back and uh, wait for the civil war to to mellow down before coming. But things continued to deteriorate, and uh, coming home did not happen as planned for the family. So I think uh, it has affected our experience as a writer because uh, life has always been, our stories are always are always about the Somali people telling people about the. Somali people, their life and their experiences, and it, is, it has been an integral part of our, uh, our writings. Mm, interesting. Um, okay, let's, uh, before we go into, because you talk about one very important part, uh, which is uh, what made her not to return. It is unforeseen circumstance. Yes. I want us to go deeply into this. Uh, the Somali Civil War uh, came, or what in some quarters is term as genocide. Mm -hmm happened within 1988 to 1991 mm -hmm. and uh, it was a terrible period for all Somalis in fact because none, nobody was safe. Mm -hmm. But more terrible it is in uh, in Agesa which was in northern Somali then mm -hmm. because uh, Agesa and the surrounding towns around it were almost uh, according to what the, what you find in the novel mm -hmm. they are almost decimated. I think it was more like a plan to destroy the entire, the entire, the entire, the, uh, the entire demography of the place. Mm -hmm. You know, people, many people were displaced. Mm -hmm. Children became uh, refugees, and you know, the war was 
terrible for everybody. Mm -hmm. And those who could escape were looking for means of escape and traveling out of the country. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see a lot of that in that no, in the in the novel we are working on today, and you know there is there is that displacement, disintegration, fragmentation in the society. It was a terrible war, and it was at that time. It was uh, during the reign of uh, Siad Barre. Uh, you know the Somalis, some some uh, some group themselves under the Somali National Movement and decided to fight against the tyranny and oppression been uh, been exhibited by the government of uh, Siad Barre. I think we discussed so, something like that in uh, Gariye. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, so his response was a total anni annihilation of the people. Mm -hmm. He was bent on destroying them if they would not comply to his directive or the, the decree he gives. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a terrible moment and uh, quite unfortunate mm -hmm. for many people. The history still lingers on, still lingers on, and people, many people can still forget mm -hmm the experience of that period because even i think of recent the, the i've seen uh i've seen documentaries of dead bodies being dug up from the grave yeah, there were there were yeah, so yeah. many mass graves around yeah. agesa and other and the suburbs of agesa mm -hmm. so it was a terrible moment in history one which we must never allow to repeat yeah. itself again yeah. it's not something that it's not it's not even something we should be writing about or even talking about what inhumane. it is inhumane it was cannibalistic mm -hmm. act and you see in that you see man inhumanity man inhumanity to man man was it became human life had no value you know a man could just die and there was this trick of violence with the with the people because everybody was after everybody's life or something mm -hmm. so it was it was a terrible moment in history and one which has i believe has influenced the, mo the current state of the Somali people, mm -hmm. you know, the, the value for peace. Yeah. It is when you've seen such wastage of life, you've seen such wreckage, despoilation mm -hmm. of, of, of human life and property, then you come to... After all your investments. Yes, you come to, you come to value the essence of mm -hmm. peace in a society, what mm -hmm. peace means. And that is why I think today uh, Somaliland is enjoying the peace it enjoys today because they've experienced war and they know that what they are saying today is never again. It should never happen again. Mm -hmm. And there's so much investment going on to, to, to ensure that there is long-lasting peace in the society, that children can grow from, from, uh, from being toddlers into adulthood, that there is hope for the future, that the young ones can look and think of tomorrow because they know that they will grow into that tomorrow. Yeah. But in a situation where there is war, if, as a young person, you can't even think of what will happen tomorrow because yeah. tomorrow you may be no more. But now I can see, I see the faces of the young ones, I see them smiling and I see that there is peace, I see the essence of peace, that peace engenders hope mm -hmm. in the society. It makes people believe that yes, there is a tomorrow and I can mm -hmm. succeed. Mm -hmm. So that is what I see in that aspect. Um, in the, this work, um, I think is closely related to some writers' uh, work in the past that depict the picture of their own community. Uh, can you explore this um, um, relation relating this text to yeah. um, I think other writers? As we know in literature, mm -hmm. literature or uh, let's say writers thrive more where there is oppression. Mm -hmm. And in, there was a certain time I was talking about South African writers, mm -hmm. and I said that the the glory of South African literature has dwindled into in, into nothing because. Mm -hmm. The, the highest point of South African literature came during the apartheid yeah. regime, right. where you had writers like uh, Dennis that. Brutus, yeah. uh, you had Ato uh, Fugad, uh, who wrote since the Bazi is dead. We had uh, who was Mazizi Kunene. Kunene. Uh, yeah, so we had lots of these writers. We had Otto Michali. Mm -hmm. This this was South African writers. Mm -hmm. They were writing about the apartheid regime, mm -hmm. and you know in uh, Malawi you can talk about. Uh, Jack Mapanji, uh, yes. So who wrote the chattering uh, work tales of, the, of from Gikuyu prison or something? Yeah, yeah. And you know, we had also Ungugi Wathiongo from yeah. from Kenya. Mau Mau. Yeah. yeah. Then you had uh, Walusha Inka, the man died. Yeah. With you know? no child. Uh, yeah. So with uh, no child. Yeah. You see, and also you can look about uh, Sly Chenikoka of Zimbabwe from of Zimbabwe in mm -hmm. the former Rhodesia. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote uh, uh, the tons, harvest of tons. Yeah, yeah. So you see that the trend is that. Literature, great literature comes out, uh, is born out of great oppression mm -hmm. and suppression in the society. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, because this is the, the reason being because when there is oppression mm -hmm. or suppression, writers do not stand down. Yeah. It happens even in the, in, the Russia, in the Russian communist society. Mm -hmm. Great writers came 
from that were born from that that mm -hmm. period of oppression mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they would not stand down and watch the society continue right now take upon themselves the role of being yeah. the conscience of the society mm -hmm. they have to say something when they see that something is going wrong mm -hmm. and when it comes to war especially war becomes a material for writers to write mm -hmm. to say something about mm -hmm. you know when the nigerian civil war happened mm -hmm. you, we had uh, we had various writers we've had a uh, Supernequency divided with stand. Yeah. We've had uh, uh, the uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, yeah. uh, half of the Yellow Sun, yeah. and uh, the American Civil War itself. You remember Stephen uh, Stephen Crane, Crane. Yeah. the Red Badge of Courage. Yeah. So basically, war has always been a so a material for people to write about. And you know, I once I was in class, mm -hmm. my lecturer was asking, mm -hmm. what advantage mm -hmm. as the, as a war the Breakfast Civil War given to the literary world? Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking, what advantage could war be to literature? Then he said that because of that experience, mm -hmm. so many people have written on that particular subject. Mm -hmm. You know, not because they encourage it, but because they want the society to always remember, to go back and see what happened. So that when somebody stands up and clamors for war, mm -hmm. they will ask you, go and read what this person wrote. Yeah. Then when you get a feeling of that experience, mm -hmm. you will always know that it is always best yeah. to have peace yeah. in all situation. Mm -hmm. So that is what has happened there. And one, one funny aspect is the fact that when, whenever this war happens, it is those of the younger age who may not even have been born at that time mm -hmm. that write great, the greatest stories about them. Mm -hmm. And we've seen Nadifa Muhammad experience being documented there. Mm -hmm. And Nadifa, at the time the war was happening, she was not even Nagisa, she had already left. Mm -hmm. And we've also seen uh, in, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, she was not even yeah. born at the time yeah. of the Civil War, yeah. but she was able to document yeah. this story based on what she heard. Yeah. And I think it's a touchy issue because some people never recover from yeah. it. Yeah. Some people never recover. They can't write because when they go back to reimagine that horror, yeah. it is difficult for them to to commit their thoughts to paper because, you know, it's, it's a terrible experience. Yeah. And yeah. if you have that experience one-on-one, -on -one, it is not easy for you to sit down and recount it without shedding tears. Yeah. You know, Achebe experienced the war. You know, Achebe of Nigeria experienced the Nigerian Civil War. Yeah. And as at the end of the Civil War, he could not, he, he could only come up with yeah. a book of short stories. People were exp expecting a novel from him. But he could only come up with a, 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 a collection of short stories yeah. started with yeah. Girls at War. Yeah. It was much later, at the terminal stage of his life, that yeah. he wrote, uh, there, was no, there was a country. There was a country, it is not on the same par as a novel. It's not a novel, it's a, it's a memoir. So you can see that. Even some people criticize as uh, uh, Eurasia because he attacked from uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, tribes. Yeah, in that basically, area. because yeah. he, he had a lot inside him. And that book was just an opportunity for him to vomit yeah, these things out before. Yeah, before, yeah, before yeah, so he already achieved what he wanted to achieve. Yeah. So you see, hmm. it, what, if you look at it very well, it's always difficult for those that experience it yeah. to, re to say something or write something about it. But the people that can give, that even give a very factual description mm -hmm. of what happens are those who are born after or who did not have direct contact with it. Yeah. Like, as you can see, as you've seen the work of Ch uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, yeah. Alpha of the Yellow Sun. Yeah. 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 Before her, I've seen, uh, uh, the, the, I think, Women Are Different yeah. by Flora Wapa. It was about, was it Flora Wapa or Buchi Emechata? I think it was Flora Wapa. Flora Wapa. So you have seen that work. It was based on the. It had the. Uh, it was wrapped around the Biafran yeah, civil war. Yeah. There was a separate sequence divided with that, but yeah. none came you comes close to the half of the yellow sun, which is more graphic yeah, and descriptive exactly. in in detail. Mm -hmm. And the same applies with uh, with uh, Stephen Crane, Red Badge of Courage. Yeah. Critics agree that yeah. it was the best a typical civil war picture of what happened, of what happened in, in during the period. So, and one. with Nadifa Muhammad, yeah. we have the same trend occurring. Mm -hmm. I cannot say for now if it's ours is the best because um, uh, there are others that yeah. we are still here to explore. Yeah, yeah. But still, I think she has given a very graphic description of what happened in a beautiful language because our language is poetic. We are going to get to the language yeah, aspect yeah. and talk about it. All right, let's uh, go into the uh, plot development of the story. Uh, what um, what is the story all about? Yeah, the story is uh, based on the uh, Somali civil war that happened uh, from 1988 to 1991. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, the way she tells the story, she she tells the story from the angle of three women mm -hmm. who. Uh, 
who, uh, the story is actually divided into three parts uh, based on the plot. The first part, the three women are brought together. Mm -hmm. Then in the second part, they go their separate ways and we read about mm -hmm. their separate lives. Yeah. Then at the end, she brings them together again. And that is the third part. There are three parts of the, of the book. Yeah. Part one, part two, part three. Yeah. Now, the, the, the women are Kausa, a woman in her 50s. Mm -hmm. Then uh, there is a Filsan yeah, and there is a Deku. Fisan is a young woman of about 20 to 25 years of age and Deko is a young refugee girl who escaped from Sabab uh, refugee camp to Agesa. She's nine years old, a very little girl. Now, the, the story has it that... Before you go into the story, okay. <laughs> because I want them to be put to suspense, mm. wait until after this break. So after the break, you get to know what Nadifa has for you. See you there. Welcome to QETC Qalam Educational and Technical Center. I am Ahmed Mohamed Ahmed. I am a student of Qalam Educational and Technical Center. Palam Education and Technical Center is a place that you can improve your English language. I came with zero English. Now I'm better. Come to Palam Education and Technical Center. This will help you to improve your English, your listening, your speaking, your writing and reading. If you want to speak confidently without fearing, come and try Qalam and learn how to speak in front of thousand people without fear. Alright, welcome back to the show. Uh, we will now be going into the content you have been waiting for and that is uh, the plot development of um, Nadifa's The Archers of the Lost uh, Souls. So you can continue from where you stop. You're talking about yeah. these three characters. The three characters, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have Kausa, a woman in her 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, we have his son, who is a soldier, mm -hmm. working for the Somali army. So she's on the opposition side. Mm -hmm. And we have Deku, a girl of nine years old. Now, each of these characters have inner troubles. They have something troubling them from their past. Mm -hmm. Now, Kausa has, was married to a very young, handsome mm -hmm. policeman mm -hmm. who lost his life due to the oppression of the of, of, of the system of the uh, of the the uh, siad Baris regime then we also had the filson she's a soldier she, she's a soldier drafted to uh, agesa to come and monitor dissident voices in the society and help to quash the insurrection so while she was here but as uh, she is from a home where the father is a tyrant, the father ruled around the house with the iron hand, mm -hmm. and the mother was already out of the house. Mm -hmm. So she, the father was a, 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 a divorcee. Mm -hmm. So because of that, she did not have a stable life. Her father was always strict on her because her father felt that she looked like a mother, and he didn't, he didn't want the kind of experience he had with the mother. He felt the mother betrayed him, mm -hmm. and so he didn't want the same experience with his mother. So he was always treating Filsan with her own hand and telling her what to do, even dictating mm -hmm. her life, where, what part her life should take. Mm -hmm. So she was basically what you can call a daddy's girl, mm -hmm. and she lived not for herself, but for her father. Mm -hmm. Her standard of morality was that which was detected by her father. If her father said this is okay, it is okay, okay by her. Mm -hmm. So she had that yearning, and because of that now, she was always... She had a yearning to meet her mother, mm -hmm. make, you know, make that contact with her mother and feel the warmth of a mother in her life, which was missing, mm -hmm. but she never had one. In sociology, we call it incomplete socialization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that is more like what she experienced then. Then Deku also, Deku was a refugee girl. She escaped from the refugee camp. Mm -hmm. She doesn't even know her mother. Her mother gave birth to her, her mother gave birth to her and the woman was heard no more of, it just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So, and she grew up in the refugee camp. So there's that, sense of family she needed she needed somebody to call her own but she never had anybody to herself she was always alone so when she escaped to agesa she felt that uh, maybe she could actually find somebody she could call as and she came to agesa because there was an independent celebration that's where the story started from there was an independent celebration the women were asked to come to the 
to the uh, field to gather and wave at the military junta. That's in 1991. Yes, they forced them to come. And while the women came there, Deku also came. She wanted to dance because there was the promise of getting issues yeah. if you join them in dancing. But she was looking too tattered. Mm -hmm. And the military junta did not want the the uh the expatriate or the, i mean the those that came from outside yeah. the foreign journalists yeah. to see that tattered image so they wanted to draw out draw her out of the of the group of dancers of the young people dancing mm -hmm. so uh, kosa was amongst the people seated on the on the pew and she was watching this girl being manhandled mm -hmm. so her mother instinct stepped in mm -hmm. she had she got up and tried to defend the girl mm -hmm. and meanwhile kosa has a history of giving birth to children that die early and she has buried a lot of children, of children in, her, in her backyard mm -hmm. and that is where she plants the uh, the trees she plants so she calls that place the orchard mm -hmm. that is actually the orchard of lost yeah. souls that we're talking mm -hmm. about so the last child she had which was a girl mm -hmm. also died because of the frustration of the brutal regime military regime yeah. she was arrested because she joined some students to protest yeah. and she was taken to prison mm -hmm. before you know somehow I think in that it, was, it wasn't mentioned explicit, explicitly, but mm -hmm. the story suggested that she has she was raped by the policeman, a young girl of not more than twelve or something, yeah. who was still in school. She was raped while in detention, and because she got pregnant, mm -hmm. and she left home for a place. Uh, the mother did not know when she came back. She came back like she just she came back home after a while, and because of the frustration of the life, that that experience of having been brutalized by the regime the young lady set herself on fire and died so she had a terrible experience in her past about her children and her husband and she was much more in support of the somali national movement because of the experience with the the brutal regime of uh, the military government so she had to step into to defend deco in the press she was also arrested deco managed to escape and she was taken to the prison Fusan was supposed to interrogate her. Fusan came, who was a soldier, interrogated her. And while he was interrogated, she became, uh, Fusan became violent with her and attacked her. So at the end of the day, she broke her spine. That's a woman uh, treating another woman badly. Yeah, yeah. So when she broke her spine, then uh, she was released the following day. She was taken to the hospital for treatment from there to her house. She could no longer work. And she remained bedridden for so many months like that. And while there, this was the time that the, the, the noise of revolution was rising and uh, this, at this period, there was that, the, the things were not working as they should work in the society. So with this, with the whole thing, this, the woman was bedridden, Deco was meanwhile looking for this woman, she could not find the woman. And at another point in time, the school, the school children protested. For you to know how tough it was, for children to be protesting yeah. against the government, ordinary. I think we have that in Japan now. <laughs> yeah, so it's happening right you now. You can in, see. I mean, that, it, no, that means in uh, in China. In China. Yeah, yeah. So that means that the oppression has become too much that yeah. even children can no longer take yeah, it. Yeah, take it. They had yeah. to fight against. Fight that also right. happened in Sudan. You yeah, see? I remember. Yes, yeah, students yeah, came yeah. out to protest. Yeah. So, but these ones were not even university students. We are talking of High, primary school, uh, primary school, primary school, school, school yeah, You can yeah, see. So, yeah. but the the reaction of the reaction of the of the regime yeah. was to arrest the school children and throw them into jails. That was what was happening then. That happened in Gambia. Um, uh, Yahya Jame did something of such. You see? A lot of children were killed. And, and you see where is They protested. Uh, yeah, the same thing. The same they thing protested. They killed kill them. He just it? ordered the soldiers to eliminate them. What kills they died. What my worry is that why should history keep repeating itself? Why don't we learn from history? Somebody has tried something before, it did not work. Why do you try the same route again? Why do you? Why was People don't learn thing? from the past. Sometimes. So, you see, mm. these students were taken to the, uh, to the jail. The second time again, they protested and they were arrested. At that time, Deco was unfortunate. She found herself amongst them. Mm. And she was taken to jail. There she met some prostitutes and she began to relate with them. And I didn't know, I didn't know she, she was freed. But later again, she was to meet those prostitutes and they were to house her for a while. She was to live with them. In the in the house so they became like the people she could point to as yeah. family yeah. and you know with time as time went on the war continued to uh, things continued to change in society mm -hmm. the war was coming on strongly yeah. Fiosan could not uh, she was alone she did, she did not find that she was even a victim of oppression because a senior army officer tried to harass her sexually mm -hmm. then at the point in time she became famous after she killed a man for the because the man asked what do they want from them? She they went to a village to to destroy their water. Mm. 
mm. and this man protested. Fishan shot the man. Mm. So that experience now. Uh, the same Fishan that uh, broke the yeah, back, broke of, the back uh, of this woman of the woman of, the woman. of, the woman. of, of, of Kausa. Uh, so Fishan became popular because mm. of the action she took. They were saying that uh, the woman also can show power. Not only the men can mm. defeat the insurrection. So they accuse they accuse the innocent man of helping rebels mm. to escape. So and that was that was the accusation they gave, and they, for that reason they felt it was right for Fizan to shoot him. But Fizan and what, never, what was her gain at the end? She, she, ended she never up arrested. Being she never arrested. arrested because she she had that feeling of guilt in her, even though it was not it was shown in the novel, but not too much. But she had that feeling of guilt that she had done something wrong, even though they were praising her for it. Mm -hmm. And after a while, the person, the man she began to love, uh, uh, the uh, boss and who is the captain, mm -hmm. Roble. Uh, Roble was also attacked by the rebels and he died. Mm -hmm. It was while he died and Fizan was in the hospital that Fizan began to see the real situation of things. Mm -hmm. People were being brought in, innocent people were being brought in. Their blood was being taken mm -hmm. so that they can be used to treat the, the soldiers who were attacked. Mm -hmm. You know, that is innocent civilians yeah. were being wasted. So she saw the situation and knew that it was terrible. It was, it was, it was not a good thing. And that was where she opted out of the army. She escaped from the hospital and was trying to find her way out of the system. Ethiopia, entirely. right? No, not Ethiopia. Yet. She was just trying to escape from the system. She didn't want to be part of the whole thing because she was beginning to see the urge for blood, the the the, the, vamp the vampire uh, style of of attack, which they were which, which they were executing. And she mm -hmm. also entered in the novel that the purpose of attacking Agesa and the and its environs was a total decimation of the place to change the topography of the society mm -hmm. so you can see it was a terrible it was an hourly experience a terrible one that shouldn't even be mentioned as part of history it's mm -hmm. so so terrible then you know after that she as she escaped from the place she found herself uh, by then deco had already deco somehow uh, the prostitute ran away and left for Ethiopia and left her alone. Yeah. And while so man, she did not go with them. She did not go with them. A man tried to harass her oh, okay. because the man they left her. They left the man. They left her in the care of a, of, oh, of a man. Okay. And the man felt okay. This is a sexual object. Yeah. So she managed to hit him on the head. And if while he fainted, she escaped out of the house and ran away. So somehow, while she was running about from place to place, she located the house of Kausa and met her benefactor, the person who saved her in the previous experience. Mm -hmm. So she was with Kosa and there, later on, she were, they were to be joined by Fisan, who was also running away from mm -hmm. the experience with the military. Mm -hmm. So they met together in the same house and they decided that the best thing to do was to escape out of the place. Mm -hmm. So, and the story ended at the point whereby they fi finally found, they, they finally got to a refugee camp in a part in the region uh, in the part of uh, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. they escaped to Ethiopia, and Kausa was the one who, who paid mm -hmm. to get them to to get uh, to uh, for their escape journey mm -hmm. to Ethiopia. So basically, we see that she said did something wrong to Kausa, yeah. but Kausa was good enough to forgive her, mm -hmm. and together they escaped. Mm -hmm. But you see the balance, the way the characters were positioned, mm -hmm. we see different. We see from their view different aspects of the war. Okay. We see from the view of Kasa, who is an old woman, mm -hmm. and we see from that of Deco, who is a young girl. Then we see from uh, Fusan, who is in her twenties. Yeah. So these are three generational of women, like you can say, the grandmother, the mother, mm -hmm. and the child. And the child. Mm -hmm. So there you see that they both from the three angle we get to see their involvement, the involvement of the three generation, the old people, the younger one, and the children. How their perception and involvement in the war at that time how everything played out uh, let's look at the theme of this um, uh, this uh, very important novel if you look at the theme uh, i think um i'm seeing the effect of war on women yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. seriously uh, the women and children are more affected when it comes to uh yeah. war what can you say general about this that, that is true that is true because you see that uh, the brutalization of Kausa, mm. uh, Deco being a young girl, sexual mm. harassment she had to face on several occasions. From the part of even the right. father, starting from home. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about uh, the, uh, is it Kausa? Kausa. From home. Yeah. Having the father uh, dictating. Yeah. But that is war within. No, that, that, that is Fusan. Yeah. Uh, Fusan. Fusan. Yeah. A physical, uh, it's an uh, internal war, it's a psychological yeah. one. At, at Before going outside to experience all of them having physical... At, at the point that when she was even young, she recounted an experience of her father mm -hmm. maltreating her because she went out with an, uh, her friends, she went out with her cousins, not even her friends, mm -hmm. her cousin, mm -hmm. went out who came from abroad, they came from the outside country, mm -hmm. and 
when they came she went out to spend some time with them and when they came back the father dealt with her seriously mm. beat her and even asked the maid of the house to check if she has been disvergent mm. you know that is ah, terrible right. so she she felt she it, she had that psychological yeah. trauma from her father from the, mm. the way uh, the father is managed that the father was saying that you want to become a prostitute like a mother mm. i'm going to show you in this house the father beat hell out of her mm. that it even made her uncle, who was the brother to her, who is the brother to her father, prote protest against the father' maltreatment. He, he moved out of his of the house immediately with his children mm -hmm. because he could not stay in endure such a situation whereby mm -hmm. the brother will, be t will become a tyrant to the to the children. Mm -hmm. So he had to move out and go to a hotel because he came for to spend some few time to an holiday in in Mogadishu, mm -hmm. and the, that's where the family is. Mm -hmm. And then he saw the the brother, his own brother, maltreating the daughter. So he, out of to protest that, he left with his family. But the father did not care. The father wanted to shape the daughter, the, his daughter, into what he wanted, not what the girl wanted for herself. So he even influenced her joining the the army. But to come to think of it, yeah. he was not even as he's not even as innocent or as uh, as good as he claims to be, or the kind of poster he's trying to present himself. Because mm -hmm. in the novel, we get to learn that. He has been suspended from the army indefinitely because he was involved in certain corruption issues. Mm. So you can see that he is not even a good person, but he is trying to force his will on the daughter. And because of that, now there is that vacuum, that space of emotional uh, fulfillment which Fusan never had. Mm. She never had anybody to call her own. She yeah. doesn't even till she grew up. She never even had a boyfriend. So and she was growing up into a woman, a woman mature enough to be. To be married, to be in the in, with the with the man or married, but she doesn't have anybody to call her own. She doesn't have a mother to call her own. So the 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 need of the three characters were fulfilled in each other because Kausa, who is a fifty year old man, doesn't have daughters. She yearned for somebody to call her own. She now has Deko and Fisan. Fisan, who needed the mother figure in her life, has Kausa, and Deko. Who needs somebody's yeah, family? Yeah. Found the two women to yeah. call hers, and they so, went. They ended up in a in a camp. Yeah, in a camp together uh, as outside one. Outside So, and even at the end of the this, in the, the the end of the novel states that when the the coordinator of the camp came out and asked them, "Who is this to you?" and she said, "That's my mother, and that's my grandmother." Mm -hmm. So they identified as a family at the end of the novel. But you know, looking at it from the angle of the women, like. Uh, I think she said it somewhere, Nadifa Muhammad said it somewhere maybe in the yeah. preface of the book that women, the impact or the role of women in yeah. the war are not uh, were not so much mentioned. Mm -hmm. But even at that, I believe she could have given us the balanced story. Maybe the men there were just shadows. Mm -hmm. She did not push them out of this. So That's exactly men, where I'm going. The men were <laughs> hidden. That's so why she I only see. presented yeah. the women the women angle. Angle. And I yeah, believe I that I didn't see anything even, that has to do with who a man. Even on if their the, even if the men as if they did not suffer. The men that were there yeah. were just the were the uh, ones that were the oppressors. Yes. That's, yeah, that's how it's saw everything. They, if you look at every scene, you will see that uh, the picture of oppressor, the rapist you know those who are tempted, the yeah, uh, the the corrupt person. So I was no, I was I was itching people. to see to yeah. see a man compliment them because I believe the in complementarity. Uh, it yeah. shouldn't be a woman woman thing. Let yeah. us also see the role of the men. At least one man would not have done. Would uh, have perhaps been uh, that's our own mirror. So you know, as you have said, you know, she's trying to show the effect of war. Uh, yeah, because she's, on women. She believed that women, were, the women, the, women are aspect the, were not yeah, much represented yeah, in, yeah. The, in, in the in, in so the So that is our. So own she's method, trying to clearly. present the the exactly. role the women play. But even exactly. if she's doing that. At least a little bit of balance would not have uh, would not have. Anyway, we we'll get that next time. Right. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much right. for uh, giving us uh, a thorough exploration of this uh, wonderful text. We have seen what Nadifa has uh, done in the text, um, and I believe that um, for those of us who didn't know about what happened in Argesia before, uh, find time to read the text, and you will surely enjoy it. See you next time. Thank you.